The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. As Professor Miller said, our project was called Number Squares. Um, we sort of like changed the name to the N Value Game. Um, basically, our agenda for the day is going to be over a few definitions to set up the problem. Ida is going to talk about the behavior of the three value game, and then Matt is going to talk about the behavior of the four value game, and also the N Value Game over the real numbers. Um, but before we get started, I want to just show a quick example of the four value game where we have four integers. And so we're going to label these vertices 0, 3, sorry, this is kind of low, 6, and 3. Okay, now in this game, this dynamical system, every time we move to a new state, we simply take the vertices, we make a, a point at the midpoint, and we label it with the absolute value of the difference here. So this is going to give us 3, 3, 3, and 3. Now if we iterate this once more, we're going to go to 0, 0, 0. And we can see at this point that if we keep going, we're only going to stay at this fixed point, 0, 0, 0, 0. OK. So. With that example, a couple of questions come to mind immediately. You know, we, we want to consider if different values on these vertices give us different long-term behaviors. You know, will we always go to this point, this fixed point of all zeros? Or are there, there are values that we can choose for these vertices that that won't ever happen? In order to sort of investigate these topics, we first want to give the definitions of what we mean by state and game and transition. Um, so the first thing is we have a state. So state S of the n value game is just an ordered list of the vertices a1, a2, through an. Okay, so in this in the four value game example, we start with A1 on the top left and we move <coughs> by convention. All right, so the next thing we have for a state is the operator. So we just call it T, the operator T. So this transitional T works in the sense that T of S gives us the absolute difference of the adjacent vertices. So we have a2 minus A1. And then the last one loops around because we can see it here, it's touching it first. So we have A1 minus AN. All right. The last thing that we need to define here is a game. So a game is just going to be the collection of the states S0. So now that we have the definition of game. Jack, what's the relationship? Okay, that's a good point. All right, so the relationship here between S0, S1, and Sm is simply that Sm corresponds to m applications of our operator, T, on the initial state. Okay, sorry about that. Um, now, the point of this this notation is we want to look at the long-term behavior of these games. Um, you know, we, we want to investigate whether or not it actually goes to the fixed point, and if it doesn't, what other types of behaviors are possible. So what we did was we defined our games to be something called k -sick. So a game is k cyclic if there exists some m such that m plus 
plus k applications of the operator on the initial state is equal to m applications on the initial state. So in our example above, we have a one cyclic view because we applied the operator twice when we got to the state, the fixed one, zero, 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 zero. If we apply it a third time, we're still at that same state. Okay? So are there any questions about k cyclic? Alright, so the opposite, then the opposite, if there doesn't exist an M such that this is true, then we call these games non repeat. Alright, so moving on from that, we want to, our goal of this is to study these these k-cyclic and non-repeating behaviors in, in these different settings. Um, in order to look at that in some of the, the different scenarios, we found it very useful to define a notion of equivalence. So basically we want to say, if we have two states, x and y, when are they equivalent? Okay, so the first thing that we realized was that there's something that we refer to as equivalent by offset. So if we have our state S, which is just the first state, and then we add some constant value K to each of the vertices. So we offset each of these vertices by K. We have this. Well, if we, if we look at operator applies s, we get these differences from 4. But it immediately follows from the definition of our operator that this k is going to fall out of every single term because we just look at the first example. We have an a2 plus k minus an a1 k is going to cancel for all of these vertices. Okay, so this is equivalence by offset. The next concept we had was the equivalence by scale. So when we talk about scaling, we want to choose a number greater than zero, and then we want to take our state s and transform it by multiplying scaling all the vertices, such that we have this sequence. Now, because r is greater than 0, if we look at applying the operator to this scaled, the scaled state, we're going to get something that looks like this, where the r can be factored out of both of these. But because r is greater than 0, we can actually factor it out of the absolute value sign. And this here is going to be equivalent to just scaling the resulting state from applying the operator. Why do you care, Why do you care if r is greater than 0? Doesn't it do the same thing if r is negative? If r is less than 0, will it do the same thing? I mean, you, you won't, it won't scale by r, it's scaled by absolute r, right? Am I missing something? Um, that's true, but we want to constrain it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, because it's negative or turn into a scale by R, then that's that's what we'll keep it. Yeah, we so I mean for for our definitions we care about R being greater than zero because when Matt wants to talk about the long term behavior, um, this is going to be this notion here is going to be very important. Um, okay, so the last sort of bit of the, the equivalence relation was also the trickiest part. Um, and that's what we refer to as equivalent by symmetry. So before explaining this, um, actually, 
one of the, the big things that we notice is when we look at, say, this example, where we see this transition operator applied to the state, each state only depends on its adjacent neighbors. Okay. So when we talk about symmetry, we talk about looking at permutations of the vertices such that we're preserving this property that the adjacent neighbors are, are unchanged. Um, so this is, this is sort of easiest to see first uh, by an example. And so that's why, that's actually why I drew this up here. So these, these eight pictures here represent all the possible symmetries of the four value game. The top four we can see are just a, a rotation, right? So if we move to, from the first one to the second one, we simply rotate it first as once counterclockwise. These ones here are just flipping about the, the, the axis. Um, but the example that I wanted to show to, to prove that this doesn't affect anything um, is if we look at the state S is equal to, remember now, 1, 2, 3, 4, 7. Now if we apply this transition, we're going to get 1 in the first, 2, and then six. Now the trick is, if we if we then look at one of the permuted versions of S. So say we look at, and when we so when we talk about these permutations, we're going to talk about permutation sigma on the dihedral curve. So those eight pictures right there are representing the dihedral curve. So when we talk about this permutation sigma on S, one of the examples that we could look at is simply rewriting S 4, 2, 1, 7. So this translates to flipping the first value and the third value, which we can see up here is simply this transformation. Okay. So if we then apply the operator, on this yes. we have two, one, six, and three, which is itself just a permutation of this. So we say that the operator applied here is just another permutation applied to the resulting value. Okay. So one of the so the final thing then is to sum up all three of these notions of equivalence. So we can say that two states, x is equivalent to y, if and only if there is an r greater than zero permutation from the dihedral group sigma x and a constant k such that we can get the exact state. Think given by negating all the entries is not equivalent. What? Think given by negating all the initial ver vertex values is not equivalent. Um, no. So that's. Well, they come equivalent after one. Right. So after but one one application. So the way that we avoided even considering that is we just restricted ourselves to only looking at positive value vertices, um, because as he mentioned, after one application with the absolute value operator, all of the vertices are going to be positive. So any starting state that has negative entries can be transformed after one, one application into a, a different state that is all positive. Um, so yeah, the, one of the, the quick things to note before Ida gets into the three value game is this, this notion of scaling. So scaling allowed us to immediately reduce the complexity of states that have integer values from the rationals. So if we take our vertices as rational numbers, we can simply get a common denominator and factor that out. Right? So if we so if we have some s is in q, and we can transform this into another state, 
that is just on the integers, right? Because we factored out the common denominator. All right. So with that, he is going to talk about the behavior of the three value. So as you can um, uh, imagine, the three value game is just you have a a triangle, and at the end of the points you have three values. So I'm just going to give a quick example. Just random example. So for this, the game goes to two, two, and four. And then you uh, subtract the points again. And so this would go to zero, two, and two. And then if you do it one more time, one more iteration, you get again two, two, zero. And so you can probably see that um, this particular three value game um, has a cycle It's just for this part of your game that um, the you enter a three cycle of this form, right? Of zero x x x zero x. Um, so we're going to talk about the end behavior of all three value games. So um, before we do that, uh, I want to go over some definitions. So there are two key definitions. So one is of a non-trivial -trivi uh, three value game, and one is of a non-trivial three value game. So a non-trivial, right. let's do trivial first. So a, three, a trivial three-value game is one in which the start state is of the form. X, X, where X is a positive integer. So essentially with this game, and only this game, on the first step, you have you know, your transition times uh, multiplied by the uh, start state gives you uh, 0, 0, 0. Right? And so uh, definition of a uh, non-trivial view value game is just one you know, in which you don't get Zero, zero, zero as the um, as the state after one iteration. Okay, so what do you guys think happens um, as the end behavior for all three value games? If you guys can kind of think about it really quickly, since it's only three numbers you have to deal with. Okay, besides Zach, who's been working on this paper for about a month now, anybody else? <laughs> they all have length zero or three. Or Excuse one, me? They all have length one or three. Uh, length, length one or three? Yeah. Um, that is close, but um, they can have longer lengths, but the end behavior of all of them um, is, is that they're going to all um, basically cycle in a three cycle game. Okay, so we're just going to prove this theorem that all. Non-trivial three-value games um, over positive integers cycle or have a three-cycle of four So I didn't pick that because you know, it was a random example. All all three value non-trivial three value games are going to cycle in the form zero x x. So as I write these three cases down, um, try to you know think about what happens um, after one or two iterations of the of the game. States are bef right before the transition to the next state. And the 
S and Y, they just represent different values um, and different positive energy values. And these two cases, case two and case three, are just going to enter um, the case one after one iteration. Um, we don't need to do an example, right? So you can you can write this out in a diagram and just say that. This is going to cycle into, um, and, and this is going to enter three cycle, and these two cases uh, we're just going to transition into case one. Uh, the more interest, the more interesting case is case four and five. So case four is actually just a. Um, subset of case five. Um, and in order to consider these two cases, uh, it's it will be useful to have another definition, or final definition for this section. And it's the definition for range. So uh, right, right here. So the range is uh, essentially the largest positive difference between uh, two values in a particular state. So range can just be defined as the max uh, the max value in the game minus the min, where s represents uh, that all the values in the game. So as you can see, um, in this game, uh, if we if we assume that um, you know x is small is less than y, and we can assume that because, um, like I said before, when you're dealing with base, essentially a, a um, number line, so if x and y are in uh, positions that make y uh, make x larger than y, then you can just uh, basically essentially rotate the game so that you have. This, the second entry be smaller than the third entry, right? So if x is smaller than y, then the range in this game before the transition is y, right? y minus zero. And so for case four and case five, um, the ranges uh, after one iteration will decrease, and after a second iteration also decrease. So after every iteration, if you're in case four or case five, the range will decrease. And so um, any wait, any questions before I yeah. yeah when would you ever get to case two if you're starting to exactly so for case two is case two is one of those cases where it's the initial you have to have the initial state being case two in order for you to be in this but we're you starting with positive integers yeah okay yeah so it's it's impossible like you said to get to this to case two which is a good observation from another case because in order to get two zeros, you need to have uh, basic, essentially four sets of numbers that, you know, you need to have um, two pairs of numbers that are similar and you're, you only have three values to deal with, right? Um, so, because um, the first three cases uh, enter the cycle, three cycle after the first iteration um, and because case four and case five will always decrease in range until um, you reach case three, then you know that proves that the, in a three value game, um, in a non-trivial three value game, uh, all the all the games enter a three cycle, and you'll never enter um, the form x x x from any of these cases because again, if you think about it as uh, numbers on number line, it's impossible to get three of the same numbers if you're subtracting um, all permutations of the numbers. Um, and so with that, uh, I'll let Matt talk about the four value game. So after answering some interesting questions about the three value game, the next natural thing to ask is, so what about the four value game? We've, we've spent a lot of time building up to this, but uh, as it turns out, uh, 
It is not the case that the four-value game demonstrates cyclic behavior. It's specifically the four-value game over the integers. And we'll talk about the four-value game over the integers and over the reals. And there's a fundamental difference between those two sets that leads to some interesting properties. But to start with, we'll make a bold claim. And that claim is the following. There are um, all four-value games over the non-negative integers converge to fixed point zero, 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 zero. And the goal here is very similar to the, the concept of the range in the last goal, but in this case it's a little more direct. We're going to show it in the following manner. Uh, normally, taking an application of one of our transition rules to a state is going to do one of two things. It's either going to reduce the maximum value, or it's going to leave the maximum value the same. So one, one case where it stays the same is suppose we have the state 2, 0, 2, 0. The transition here goes to 2, 2, 2, 2, and we haven't decreased it at all. Um, it decreases maybe uh, sorry, 4, 3, 2, 1. And this is going to go to 1, 1, 1, 3. So the maximum value has gone from 4 to 3. And because we're subtracting taking absolute values, it's clearly not going to get much of it. So it'd be nice to find some sort of uh, sequence of steps that we can claim always decreases the maximum value. Because if we have that, then we have an inductive proof that basically says reduce the maximum value for each of them until you get to zero. So as it turns out, such a sequence of steps exists. And we're going to do it constructively by uh, looking at parities. So here's the proof. Uh, we'll start with the lemma. So given a state A, all entries of four operations of this transition rule in A are even. So let's start with some rules for uh, subtraction of even and odd numbers. It's good to start with some of these. Uh, we have an even number minus an even number is an even number. An odd number minus an odd number is an odd number. Even minus odd is odd. Odd minus even is odd. Do you mean odd minus odd is even? Odd minus odd is even. I do mean that, yes. <laughs> A lot of and O's here. Um, and so we'll do this by looking at some of the states that we'll make. So clearly, if I have a state that has uh, four even numbers in it, and we'll, we'll use uh, right here. If we have four even numbers, doing this subtraction, we're always going to have even numbers. So that, that state goes to itself. Uh, what state can we get that leads to four even numbers? Any thoughts? Four odd numbers. Four odd numbers, yes. <laughs> OK. OK, what goes here? Odd, even odd. Yeah, even odd, even odd. <coughs> OK, and then what goes here? This one is even, even, odd, odd. Uh, and then we have the interesting case where there are, in fact, two things that go in here. Uh, and one of these is even, even, even odd, and the other one, not surprisingly, is odd, 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 even. And so this sort of covers the universe of states. This one has three evens. This, these two have the, the cases where you have two evens, you know, the symmetry. This one has four evens. This one has no even numbers. So this is sort of proof by picture. I can take four steps from any of these states and end up in a step that has all even numbers. OK, great. So now we're going to prove this, this uh, theorem up here that all four value games converge to 0, 0, 0, 0. And the trick uses the concept of equivalence that we talked about earlier. So if I have some state A here, uh, I'm going to take four steps. And I'm going to call this state A prime. So A prime is guaranteed to have all even, all even values. Uh, and we're going to let the, the maximum value in this original state, so uh, the maximum value over A, we'll let this be M. So after taking four steps, I have a state that has all even values. 
And I'd like to say, uh, well, let's find an equivalent state. A state that has the same long-term behavior. So I'm going to pull out a factor of two. I'm going to, you know, uh, this is this is equivalent to one half a prime. So we'll call this we'll call this state b. The maximum value in b is guaranteed to be smaller than the maximum value in a. So this is a, a way of, of uh, demonstrating inductively that we're going to, you know, we have this process that exists to decrease the maximum value. And so now an astute person might say, how do I know this terminates? Well, it turns out that the uh, non-negative integers, in fact, have a least value, which is zero. And uh, so we'll, we'll terminate at zero, 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 zero. This property does not exist for the real numbers, so just something to keep in mind. They're not, uh, they're not well ordered. Okay. So. Hopefully this is a reasonably direct proof. This actually gives a nice bound on how long one of these games will take to terminate. Um, it's kind of a crude bound, as we show in the paper, but uh, it, the, uh, you're going to take at most four steps at most log two time. So if you have the maximum value, you're going to take it. You're going to be able to have it at most log two times the max value. So the, the, uh, the maximum game length is at most, um, L is at most four steps times log two of the max value. So now we'll talk about the, uh, the, the first we'll talk about the four value game on the real numbers, and there will be a natural extension to affect the n value game on the real numbers. Any questions so far? Okay. So the idea here is to sort of construct a generalization of this transition operator as a linear operator. It'd be really nice to have a linear operator. Now the absolute value function is not a linear function, which is kind of a bummer. But it turns out that we can put some constraints on the inputs to this linear operator that allow us to you know, ignore the fact that the absolute value function is not linear. So idea linearize t. So let's, the one, one direct way to do this is to say, um, I'm going to require all of the input states to be in increasing order. Now, this seems like this isn't going anywhere, but bear with me for a second. So if I have a less than or equal to b, less than or equal to c, less than or equal to d, then the old transition operator would tell, have, you know, a, b, c, d is going to absolute value of b minus a, absolute value of c minus b, absolute value of b minus c, absolute value of a minus d. If I have this constraint, I can actually remove these absolute value signs. So uh, b is larger than a, so this will be b minus a. c is larger than b. d is larger than c. And then d is larger than a, so this one flips sign here, and then I get d minus a. So we can represent this transition as a matrix now. So we'll let t, and I'm going to specifically call this t4 because we're going to be generalizing this transition to the end value game. But t4 looks something like this. So um, we're going to be getting uh, minus a plus b here, minus b plus c, minus c plus d, and then there's a minus a plus d. So let's fill up the zeros here. And you guys can verify that if we multiply this by A, B, C, D, we get out B minus A, C minus B, D minus C, D minus A. Take a second and convince yourself that this is true. Hopefully I didn't switch the minus signs. Okay. And uh, in, gen in the general case, we can extend this T4 to Tn, and the pattern of the matrix is very similar. You have a band of minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, all the way down to the last row where you have a minus 1 in this bottom left corner and a 1 in the bottom right corner. Uh, so now we'd like to talk reason a little bit about state. So there's another problem with this, a very obvious problem, and that is if we have this constraint that the, the inputs to this linear operator are in increasing order, there's no guarantee that this output is in increasing order. But the, the fix for this problem is to say, well, let's consider what, what, in what cases do we maintain that invariant. And the case that that invariant is maintained is when this is an eigen, in a positive increasing eigenvector of this transition matrix. So our, our goal now is sort of 
to search, or rather to prove that you know we can find some eigenvectors that are positive and increasing, along with a positive eigenvalue. And that, that will actually give us something really cool. If we can show that that exists for each one of these uh, T sub n matrices, then we're going to have uh, a non-repeating sequence, because we'll be able to operate multiple times, and we'll basically form a geometric series with the eigenvalues that will give us some cool states. Uh, and so in the paper, we actually do this. You can, you can work through the characteristic polynomial by expanding the determinant here. You'll get you know, uh, an upper triangular matrix, a lower triangular matrix. And there's some nice math. We're going to skip it here. It's pretty, it's pretty algebra intensive. It turns out that uh, you, you'll get uh, a characteristic polynomial for, for t sub n, 1 minus lambda n times 1 plus lambda n to the n minus 1 equals 1. And then with a little more algebra bashing, you can actually bound these eigenvalues between 0 and 1. Uh, and you can show that, that these generate an eigenvector uh, with the values uh, 1 minus lambda n, 1 minus lambda n, 1 plus lambda n, 1 minus lambda n, 1 plus, plus lambda n squared, all the way down to 1. Uh, so this is going to, this sequence, we, we verify that this is an increasing positive sequence, uh, and it is. And uh, so for the four-value case, let's look, let's look in particular. So the eigenvalue of lambda 4 is equal to like 0 0.89, I wrote it down somewhere, 0.89, 0.839, and the eigenvector that that generates is uh, 0 0.160, 0 0.295, uh, 0.543, and then 1. So this input to the four-value problem on the reals will generate an infinite non-repeating game. Uh, using the equivalence relation that we talked about earlier, you can actually generate infinitely many non-repeating infinite games. I can offset this by whatever I want. I can scale this by whatever I want, and I can take any permutations from D4. Uh, so this is kind of a cool way to generate infinite families and infinite games. Uh, and with that, we'd like to ask if there are any questions. And uh, why? Great. Yes. Any questions? Yeah. So I had another idea about playing this game on R. Um, you said you're you're essentially looking at um, when you're looking at tuples that are with each point taken from the line. Yeah. If you allow yourself to use irrational numbers, then you can take the you know the like lattice generated by these rational numbers in up to n dimensional space yeah. or like a you know the rational vector space whatever, um, and then you're playing the same game with the points taken from a lattice. It's like a polytope. Like, yeah, yeah, that that kind of thing. Right. So. Um, I don't know, maybe you can get some interesting geometric intuition about what playing the game on R looks like. Yeah, we were, we were actually we were spending a lot of time trying to get geometric insight to this problem. And I think, I think we didn't actually stumble across anything interesting, think, but, but that seems a lot harder, though. Yeah. Especially you have the, these growing things with the eigenvalue. Like, how would that happen? Yeah. Yeah.